Hey everyone and welcome to the 13th episode of the Liam McCollum Show. Today I'm going to have Dr. Veronique de Rougy on to talk a little bit about the economy, regulations, pointless regulations that are being exposed during the coronavirus, and a little bit about how the government could exacerbate the problem with the coronavirus. So yeah, Dr. de Rougy is a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center and is also a nationally syndicated columnist. She writes for Reason Magazine, sometimes the New York Times. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. Here's Dr. de Rougy. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. de Rougy. Um, if you want to just introduce, introduce yourself really quick, that would be great. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And um, I'm also a Reason columnist, and I blog at National Review. And I have a syndicated column uh, with creators. And I occasionally write to the New York Times. Oh, awesome. Okay, well, just to get into kind of what's going on right now, you have some recent articles about... Um, economic policies and certain regulations during the pandemic and your most recent is about how flawed economic policies will exacerbate the pandemic do you kind of want to talk about what those policies would be and um the certain consequences that might arise from them so we're in the midst of a recession um you know uh, partially induced by um, a government shutting down businesses um, because of um, because of a pandemic that we're in, but also because consumers don't want to come out, go out and um, don't want to get sick. And our most pressing priority is obviously to be able to develop um, the health, public health um, um, tools we need to basically address this virus that is um, apparently so deadly and is causing people to have to stay home. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the, you know, measures that are proposed are in essence um, protectionist and that it is meant to keep medical supply here in the U.S. Um, to also to bring, to make sure that the production of drugs and the production of medical devices is done here in the U.S. And if you don't think about it too hard, it kind of makes sense because you want to not be dependent in case like this of your face mask being sold, um, you know, somewhere else and then be left without enough and same for drugs and ventilators and things like this. And, and so unfortunately the buy American, the, um, um, regulations that they are, the, the Trump administration is pushing with so this idea that you know federal agency could only use um, products that are made here in America as opposed to products that are uh, made partially abroad um, as well as an export ban of medical device what it's going to do ultimately is reduce the amount of medical devices and all the tools that we need to respond to this pandemic um, these protectionist measures, they may make sense on the surface, but they actually ignore the reality that there is a good reason for all of this um, globalization to be happening, which is you get more with much less money. And, and, and of course, unfortunately, a lot of the rhetoric that is used is um, to, to push these uh, regulations is based on, on you know, unfortunately misleading data. It's not true that 80% of the drugs um, come from China, for instance. It's absolutely untrue. Um, it's a much more smaller proportion, I mean, closer to less than 2%, as far as we can tell. Um, it depends on what you look, whether you look at ingredients, the whole drug, the, and so it, it, it's really counterproductive. Mm. Yeah, so I, I live in Montana and we're already starting to see, I think we're running out of masks, we're running out of ventilators here. So would you say that that is almost like a direct consequence of not accepting country stuff? No, so, so right now, right, right now we aren't seeing yet um, 
like the consequences of these measures being put. Okay. That said, what we're seeing is that actually the consequences of other regulations that are currently in place and that actually reduces the amount of, of, um, of stockpile that companies uh, have an incentive to, to keep. Um, it's, it also is the product of a lot of restriction from the FDA and the CDC in where we can get our masks and, 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 and how they can be produced and that increases the cost and then really reduces the supply of these medical supply. So w what I wrote in my column was not so much to address the problem we have now, but to say, if you pile on those export bans and buy American provisions, you're going to make the, the problem even worse. Mm -hmm. So for instance, take the export ban, right? I mean, it may sound good on the surface and you say, well, we, we already don't have enough masks for everyone, so we should be actually keeping them here. We don't have any, enough ventilators. Um, uh, we should keep them here. The problem is that actually what ends up happening is like the threats of these exports banned means that the producers, the current producers in the U.S. see their, their net profit, the expectation of net profit can kind of go down and they readjust and think, well, you know what, this is a, this is a risky investment. Mm. And we see it over and over and over again in all areas where there have been export bans which is basically you end up with uh, fewer of the things at home mm. that have been that have been um, that have been banned um, for export you end up with much less of an investment here at home and hence much less of a of a supply now I mean, a lot of countries, there are about 20 countries who already have put in place some sort of export ban for medical supply. And, and the temptation is, is, is obviously strong to retaliate. Um, but we really shouldn't. We shouldn't because, uh, because we're going to hurt ourselves. Mm, okay. I see. So you also have another article titled uh, Coronavirus Economics, and you, and you talk a little bit about... Um, artificial prices and stuff like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the idea of price gouging might not be as like the, a lot of people think that price gouging is really bad, but it seems that you believe that it's actually a good thing. Well, so price gouging, I mean, is used to describe, you know, I mean, it, it's putting a negative tone, right? Uh, to the phenomenon of rising prices, right? Mm -hmm. but there are actually a lot of very innocent reason for the increase in prices of something. If there is suddenly a surge in the demand for something, and in this case, in my article, I was talking about face mask and hand sanitizers and toilet paper and things like this, right? Suddenly, and, and the supply hasn't had time to change, it is a normal phenomenon to see prices go up. It's normal. And, it, and it's, it's supply and demand. I mean, it's economics 101, right? Unfortunately, um, politicians tend, and, and then there is the phenomenon of actually act people who see this sudden demand. So there's a difference with people who see that there's actually a, a sudden surge and the potential to make a profit, and they not only hold these supplies, but what they do is they, when they offer them, they offer them at a high price. Mm -hmm. These are two separate things, but both, in my opinion, should not be banned or disallowed, okay. right? So, but we tend to put those two things together, but they're two separate things. But the, even in the case of someone trying to take advantage of a lack of demand for something to actually make a buck or two or 10 or 20 or 100, whatever, is actually a good thing. One of the things that's important about prices going up and when, and, and the problem is when politicians try then to discourage it, that prices going up is effectively a signal to investors and to producers that that, that product is in high demand 
and that is it, it is worth shifting resources away from something where the demand, the prices have gone up towards that resource. And that is the way you end up getting more supply. Mm. All right. So that's so um, again, politicians usually don't make a difference between the type of increases in prices, whether it's someone trying to take advantage of of the fact that there's a high demand and he's been stockpiling the stuff and and he's trying to make a, a big profit out of it. And the fact that simply prices go up because there's a surge in demand and, and it's not necessarily one person, you know, hoarding all this stuff. Um, but the reason, the, so the, the reason why, if politicians try to temper down that, that, that price hike, no matter where it comes from, is effectively is telling people, well, don't even bother shifting resources towards this. And hence, the increase in supply will not occur as needed. Mm. So, like, take the example of uh, face masks, right? I mean, the, the, the price of face mask went up, like, quite dramatically, partially, it was an increase in, it was, it was, uh, it was mostly because of an increase in, in, in demand. But what ended up happening is that companies like Sharp, electronic companies, right, that this is not their business. And in normal time, there's no profit to be had for them to be making face masks, actually started shifting resources and making face masks precisely because it had become profitable for them to do it. Mm. Now, there may also be a charitable aspect to their shifting resources, right? But it's, it's, it's important. It has another, the, the increase in prices has also an important um, uh, dimension, which is when prices go up, the hoarding that is done by consumers, right? The kind of irrational hoarding that actually is tempered down. It means that if you go to buy toilet paper and it is much higher the price than it is usually, what you end up doing is buying less of it. Right. Right? And so it has there are all these these two things. And there are, unfortunately politicians just kind of there's an emotional response and, and often called for by consumers who, who are just really upset to see something they really want, mm. you know, uh, the price of something they really want go up in price um, right. um, so dramatically. But the problem is at some point, you know, you have to make a choice between the availability of products on your shelf even though at a higher price versus empty shelves that are really cheap, a product that if they were there would be really cheap. Right. And in your article, you actually said that uh, there were, in New Jersey, at least 10 retailers received warnings from the government. That, yeah. So what, what would they do if they did increase prices? What so... Would, if they don't increase prices, right, the demand is going to continue really fast and then they will run out of, of goods. And again, when prices don't go up, you limit the number of people who are willing to shift resources to start supplying that good mm -hmm. that is now profitable to make or even to bother, to bother, you know, trying to acquire wherever or to transport, like, um, you know, during hurricanes, you see this a lot with water, right? But, and water and, and, and um, a, a bunch of other things. But the thing that people don't think about is like, when producers or people who are like, um, when people are, are trying to think about whether an activity is worth engaging in or not, they incur cost, right? And so they look at these costs. So if you're going to be going out of your way to find water where it is actually available and, and, and available, which is usually far from a place of a disaster, right? You incur costs. You have to transport it. You have to go buy it. You have to, and then there's risks too, because what if suddenly there's a big supply of water and then you're stuck with all of your water, right? And, 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 a, and, and basically you sell it at the price you bought it but you've incurred all these costs, right? I mean, there's a there's a risk too. And this is why 
this is the problem. It's 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 not just like people shifting resources and start like sharp starting to make face masks, but it's also entrepreneurs going out of their way to make the stuff available to consumers, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it has to be worth their while. And and the problem is like charity is great, right? And those who want to do it, it's just I mean, just good for them. But it actually is just not enough to temp like to satisfy the demand that exists in time of emergencies. And unfortunately, we see it over and over again, and we just never seem to learn that lesson. Mm. Yeah. So, and you're from France, correct? Oh yeah. Um, and in in the same article, you were saying that the French government has has already threatened to put in a price ceiling. How how is their response compared to the United States? Oh, well, I mean the the so the French because the government is so centralized, their response is always worse, right? Mm-hmm. Because they just and and they have a they have a in a in a way sometimes way more power than the U.S. They, they just they just impose all these restrictions. On top of that, the uh, the French government is also has also confiscated. A lot of these medical supplies and face masks and hand sanitizers and I mean it's it's just really being yeah, super centralized and very counterproductive um, uh, response to mm-hmm. this. Um, I mean, like, like it's just people can't find face masks. I mean, even in hospitals, hospitals have been um, facing um, problems for for long, long, long before. Uh, they started, I mean, the emergency room uh, industry. I mean, it's been on strike for over a year and a half over just a disastrous treatment of uh, of the doctors and nurses. I mean, we can argue what that means, but um, they don't have, they, they don't have any masks. Those guys are like, so it's, it's not, not good. <laughs> Well, and then you were also talking about charity, and you have another article about uh, private generosity. Can you kind of speak a little bit about that and what types of things we've been seeing across the country? And so, I mean, this is the thing that I always just just amazes it amazes me about America is this sense of community and this just really high sense of charity that exists. Um, and, and we see it all the time, but we notice it even more in time of despair. And this is the first column I think I wrote after, after really, I mean, uh, we, we all realized the extent of, of, of this disaster. And this is like, this was the first week I was, I was working from home. And I was just like, I was amazed looking at all the companies that were now providing services for free to consumers um, in order to, you know, for, for them to to endure what surely was going to be something really hard from, you know, the Mets during viewing online for free of operas from, I mean, all, all, all sorts of example, but also in private citizen, just going out of their ways. I mean, my Facebook page was like filled with people volunteering their time, to help elderly people, um, volunteering their time to make masks, volunteering their time to go shopping for people who were immunodepressed and didn't want to get out. Right. I mean, it, it's just like, it, it, I mean, this country is remarkable this way. It is just utterly remarkable. Restaurants um, offering, um, offering um, free food. Um, communities getting together, Comcast and other Wi-Fi providers providing Wi-Fi for free for so all of the children who are now homeschooled and are low-income uh, children could have access to Wi-Fi for four months for free. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just a remarkable. It's just a remarkable country. Yeah, and in 2011, you you spoke a little bit about um, stimulus and what people think about that can you can you talk a little bit about the two trillion dollar stimulus that was passed and what people are trying to do now and what your thoughts are on that well so 
we have to be careful to actually not call it a stimulus mm -hmm. because it's really um, um, it's not it's not a stimulus, right? It's like the, the goal of the $2 trillion bill that was passed was not, is not to jumpstart the economy. Because th this is not a traditional recession. This is, this is not a case where you have really high unemployment or for instance, there's a bubble that burst, you know, the housing bubble burst and, and you have all these companies that are going under and you have a just big financial crisis. And then you have all these people who are being laid off and you have 10% unemployment and, and, and the government uh, is trying to actually stimulate the economy by getting people back to work by providing uh, money or providing jobs or things like this or enticing company to hire or whatever. This is very different. I mean, people don't want to go out. People don't want to don't want to go buy stuff. Um, uh, the government has asked businesses to close down, restaurants to stop uh, uh, um, having people over. I mean, this is just very different. It's, so it's, you can't stimulate an economy like this. If there's no demand, um, you, you just can't do it. So what the two trillion dollar was. Uh, meant to be, and I just really, again, just I feel sorry that we, we talk about stimulus because that's not what it is. It was to actually try to kind of prop up people in this time of distress. So a lot of people have lost their jobs, um, and not because their companies, uh, you know, weren't healthy companies. Um, uh, a lot of small businesses just have seen their consumers dry, dry up and have had zero demand for their products. Um, and, uh, and the idea is well, you want, you know, people first, and, and then, and then there's the public health aspect, which is you don't want workers who could have been infected, um, to go around doing their job because they don't have, um, because it's their fear that they're not going to have income. So what what these the, the bill and the one before was meant to was to actually really kind of provide this type of relief and of income and of um, uh, lifeline to people on one hand and to companies on the other. So this is why there was first a small bill that include a lot of paid leave and sick leave provision. And then in this one, there was uh, unemployment benefit uh, expansion and 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 that expanded to uh, people who usually do not uh, do not receive unemployment benefits um, and you have also a big um, you had also a big chunk of of the bill that was meant to allow companies to borrow to try to actually stay alive mm -hmm. and also give them an incentive to keep their employees even though they were making no, no money. Mm, okay. And then now, just to talk about your last article, uh, um, I want to ask about the coronavirus puts counterproductive regulations into perspective, that one. Um, yeah. And maybe we can just go through, you have a, you have a bunch of regulations listed here. Um, so in New York, uh, the government suspended three regulations. Do you kind of want to talk a little bit about that? The first one was the... Child care provider. Oh, they, I, I only gave a few examples of mm -hmm. all the stuff that. So, the article was actually meant to kind of give an kind of an overview, but not not one that was exhaustive mm -hmm. of, of all the regulations that were removed. I think they were overall there are like over five hundred different regulations at the state, local, and federal level that were removed. Um, since this started, and so at the at the federal level, for instance, uh, you've had a lot of the a lot of the regulation that are in place that really hinder the ability of people to innovate and the ability of drug companies to to work on vaccines and to produce drugs and to do tests. Um, some of them were lifted. And um, um, through the you know the FDA through the FDA, but also a lot of the regulations that actually prevent doctors, for instance, for do for doing telemedicine, 
were lifted. There were also regulations that were lifted that allowed doctors to do business across state lines. Um, these were lifted. Um, so, and then you had at the state and local levels, right? You had all sorts of different re regulations. So, in New York, for instance. Um, you've seen regulations as, um, that were lifted that pertain to actually all the way you constrain the supply of child care. Um, so there are all these regulations that says you can't watch more than that many kids or, or anyone you hire needs to go through this really stringent process and, and, and have a, a background check done on them. And, and people say, well, do you want your children, you know, watched by criminals? Uh, um, that's the reason why they were put in place in the in the first place. But what actually the research shows is actually they don't increase safety at all. These rules, all they do is not increase safety, but it's actually constrained the supply. Mm. Um, the other type of uh, regulations that they've put in place are like that all lift they they have lifted is all the the, the the ones that prevented restaurants for allowing people to carry out alcohol uh, when they order some food. Um, and and that you've seen it in many, many, many different states. Um, and um, so um, New York is, is one of them, DC. And um, so there, there's been all sorts of regulations in Texas, for instance, it was, um, it's like, and, and, and the reason why I said it helps put those to light, as, you know, like the, show how dumb they are. Is like people are like, why? Why were these in place? If they were worth, you know, getting rid of during an emergency, why do we have them in the first place? Mm -hmm. And we really shouldn't be having them. So people are discovering that there are like regulations that prevent trucks from delivering, you know, truckers from delivering. Um, uh, to grocery stores and to liquor stores, right? Well, these these regulations are lifted because what they want, they don't want to constrain the supply uh, of delivery because they want stores to keep being stock, right. right? So you don't consumers don't face empty. But you have to ask why? Why do we, why do we have those really stupid regulations? And again, for each one of these regulations, you will find studies that said these are completely useless. Mm. You know, these are they're not doing what they what they say they will do. They only constrain freedom. Usually they save they, they serve special interest to protect them against competition. And uh, and they just basically they're just um, they alleviate the uh, the, um, the the need uh, and the uh, and the emotional uh, cravings of of the nanny state really. Right. Yeah, and I think the biggest thing there is that a lot of people don't realize, and I think the thing that if they did know about, they would agree with us more is that when you do decrease supply through regulation prices are going to go up. So like for child yeah. care, for child care, a lot of people are concerned with the, you know, child care is really expensive in some states yeah. and it's because of these regulations. So well, so child care is interesting. I just did a testimony not too long ago um, for um, uh, before Congress where I was looking specifically at, at occupational licensing impact on child care prices. And it was really stunning. I mean, it's like, first, this is a really good example of how, um, of how those regulations that are in place to restrict the number of kids that, can, that child care um, uh, suppliers can, can watch and, and, uh, and all sorts of other regulations about, about you know, having a car with enough enough um enough car seats and uh, for everyone in case of a fire um don't actually increase uh safety but when you look at the cost for instance like the one that limits the uh the number of kids there are studies that were done that show to doesn't increase safety but also what it does definitely is like if you were to reduce them if you were to reduce the requirement only by one child a across group age, you would, um, you would um, decrease the cost by 
10% may not seem like a lot, but in DC, where the cost is $24,000 a year on average, right? It's $2,400. Right. It's not nothing. And, and of course, I mean, these regulations are not just bad for consumers, they're bad for suppliers, right? There are a lot of people who are kept out of becoming health, child care suppliers by these rules. And usually they are lower income uh, people. They're immigrants, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're women, they're military, and, and they're really so constraining that you can't move from one state to another. Um, um, and so military wives in particular are really affected because if you're a nurse in one place and you have to follow your husband around because he's, because he's, um, he travels with the military, then you can't, you know, you can't, uh, practice once you're, once you move and, and, and there's a real cost to actually, you know, like changing your license to fit, you know, a particular state. So it's, it's, these rules are just idiotic, idiotic. Mm. They may have been well-meaning originally, but in the end, they hurt lower-income consumers the most, and they hurt lower-income workers too. Right. Well, yeah, thank you so much for coming on today. I know you need to go soon, but if you want to just, if you want to tell people where they can find you and then we can let you go. Well, you can, uh, you can find really all of my work at mercatus.com org um under my name and uh or you can go to reason.com under my name oh but i also uh, write for aier uh, but everything all of the everything i do um is at mercatus.org okay sounds good thank you so much thanks for having me Screen.